Chairman of Thanet District Council. Come on. Please be seated. Good evening, members and officers of council and members of the press and public. I welcome you to this meeting of the council. Now, if the firearm is activated, please vacate the building via the emergency exits. With respect to filming of the meeting, I would advise that if filming takes place, anyone in attendance in the public areas may have their image captured. I urge anyone filming proceedings to avoid filming members of the public, particularly and if there are children present. Does anyone intend to film the meeting this evening? And I don't see anyone. Any filming or recording will not be permitted for any item of business where exempt or confidential information is considered following the exclusion of the press and public from the meeting. There's a restriction on the use of mobile phones as well. Would everyone present please ensure their mobile phones are turned to silent and they are not used to make or receive phone calls whilst the meeting is progress in progress. Now, with respect to the use of microphones, in order to be heard clearly at this meeting, please can members stand up, remove your mask, and wait for the microphone to be brought to you. When the microphone is presented, please speak directly into it. Now, I go through these every council meeting, and uh, they are important, so it's as well that they're said. So moving straight to agenda item one, apologies for absence. Now I have apologies received from councillors Bambridge, Dennis, Hart, Moore and Towning. Do I have any other apologies this evening? Um, apologies from uh, Councillor Green, Chair. Councillor Green. Green, Councillor Green. Do I have any other apologies? I don't see any. Thank you very much. Agenda item two, minutes of the previous meetings. Agenda item 2A, the meeting held on the 15th of July 2021. I move that the minutes of the council meeting held on the 15th of July 2021 be approved and signed as a correct record. Please can I have a seconder? Councillor um, Ashby. Do members agree? Thank you. Agenda item 2B, the minutes of the extraordinary meeting held on the 23rd of September 2021. I move that the minutes of the extraordinary council meeting held on the 23rd of September 2021 be approved and signed as a correct record. Please can I have a seconder. Councillor Scobie this time. Second time lucky. Do members agree? Thank you. Now, moving on to Agenda Item 3, Announcements. I do have an announcement. Uh, the External Auditor's Recommendations. Would members please note that in response to the recently received Auditor's Recommendations, an Extraordinary Council meeting will be held within a month to consider the Auditor's Recommendations. The item is not on the agenda for this evening's meeting. We are expecting, in fact, I believe it's the case... Um, Democratic Services, that the meeting will be the 2nd of November, Tuesday the 2nd of November. And both adjudicators will be coming. So moving on to agenda item four, declarations of interest. Are there any declarations of interest? And in connection with this, perhaps members should declare any interest in conjunction with agenda item eight. Uh, uh, motions, we have a motion on Airbnbs, if there is any councillor who feels the need to make a declaration of interest, I don't see any. Any other declarations of interest? No. Agenda item five, petitions. Now, no petitions have been received in accordance with council procedure rule 12. So moving straight on, therefore, to agenda item six, questions from the press and public.
Now this evening four questions have been received from members of the public in accordance with Council Procedure Rule Number 13. Please note that only the questioner and respondent are permitted to speak on the question. Could the questioner please only state the name of the cabinet member to whom their question is to be put and read out the exact wording of the question that they are submitting to this council. So therefore, within agenda item 6, 6A, question number 1 from a member of the public regarding clinical waste collection. I'm pleased to welcome Mr Thompson to the meeting. Mr Thompson, could you please make your way to the front table? Are you with us, Mr Thompson? I... We don't see Mr Thompson. We don't... You're not given permission. Answered in writing. We will uh, therefore provide Mr Thompson with an answer to his question in writing. Yeah, I'm afraid so, Councillor Bainford. It does happen. <laughs> you were looking forward to this, weren't you? Members, he was going to answer this one, you see. Agenda item 6B, question number two from a member of the public regarding swimming at your leisure facilities. Um, please welcome, hopefully this time, Miss Kimber to the meeting. Miss Kimber, could you please make your way to the front table? Addressed to Council Thank you. <laughs> Councillor George Cup. Swimming is important to young children for exercise and we've found its extensive coastline for their safety. All baby and preschool swimming lessons at the pools managed by your leisure are now exclusively provided by a private organisation, Puddle Ducks. These can be much more expensive than those offered directly by your leisure for older children at £15 per lesson for Puddle Ducks. Could the Council explain why such an exclusive agreement was made and how it is in the best interest of Thanet's children? Well, thank you for that, Miss Kimber. I call upon Councillor Cobb to respond. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Miss Kimber, for coming and for your question today. Um, we agree that swimming is an important exercise for all age groups. However, we are, as a council, unable to comment on the, on the substance of your question, as your leisure is an independent organisation um, and set their prices independently from the council. But what I would say is that outside of this meeting, if you would like to email me, I'm very happy to have further conversations with you to see what possibly we can do, whether it's in meetings or situations like that, and see where we, if we can get to some kind of agreement with uh, your leisure. All right? Thank you, Councillor Cup, and that seems to have been well received. Agenda item 6C, question number 3, from a member of the public regarding the protection of venues from complaints. I'm pleased to welcome Mr Randall to the meeting. Mr Randall, could you make your way to the front table, please? Do you want a clarification to the question as well, or just the main question? Just the, question. the initial question. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Take it from there. Yeah. So the question was originally directed to um, Rhys Pugh. Um, what is Thanet doing to value and protect new and existing hospitality and music venues from complaints? the likes of which see such establishments shut down in order to appease a minority of residents who choose to live next to or within buildings and areas of high historic uh, and cultural, artistic and economic importance. Further, has Thanet considered following the City of Liverpool and others in adopting the agent of change um, or seeking to apply deed of easement to venues that would warrant it? Thank you, Mr. Randalls. I call upon Councillor Davis Porter to respond. 
I'm sorry you've got the uh, substitute. Uh, the, the question was uh, directed to Councillor Pugh, but um, uh, can I just thank you, Mr Randall, uh, for the question and also for you mentioned the additional clarification which was received. Thank you very much. In our response, I would confirm that a deed of easement is a right exercised over a piece of land or property for the benefit of another and is a private action taken by individual landowners, not the local authority. Paragraph 187 of the National Planning Policy Framework outlines that planning policies and decisions should ensure that all new developments can be integrated effectively with existing businesses and community facilities. Whilst not explicitly cited in the 2020 local plan, the Council considers the need for applicants to provide suitable mitigation in new housing proposals if the new development would result in unreasonable restrictions on existing facilities, including music venues. This includes requiring acoustic surveys and ceiling insulation to mitigate the transmission of noise. We also notify all neighbouring properties adjacent to sites of proposals to ensure that we are seeking the comments of residents and businesses about planning applications. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Saunders. Thank you, Mr Randalls. Agenda item 6D. I have question number four from a member of the public regarding Travellers Community at Ramsgate Port. And please welcome Miss Shotton to the meeting. Miss Shotton, could you please make your way to the front table? Good evening, everyone, sir. It is increasingly apparent that we are heading for a humanitarian disaster this winter for our vulnerable travellers community currently housed at Ramsgate Port unless a permanent, safe, suitable site is identified for them by TDC as required under the Housing Act 2004 and its attendant regulations. Under the human rights legislation, access to regular health care and settled schooling are among the primary entitlements of these families. At present lacking the most basic requirements, such as access to toileting facilities, their situation is one of which we should all feel ashamed. Can you report what urgent action is being taken by officers to identify sites and move this most important project forward so that these families, among the most disadvantaged of our Thanet community, can access the health care, mental health support and education they so desperately need? Thank you very much, Ms Shotton. I call upon Councillor Cook to respond. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Ms Shotton. Um, the Council commissioned a study for the local plan examination which identified a cultural need for seven permanent pitches and five transit pitches. One of the key aspects of the local plan update is to allocate suitable sites to meet the identified need. Separately, a site search was undertaken by the Council to identify possible emergency stopping sites for gypsies and travellers. This is now included in the local plan work. A call for sites was undertaken in early 2021. The submissions will be assessed through the local plan processes. Uh, council officers, officers are also looking for, for other potential sites, including those in public ownership to meet the identified needs. But also what I would like to add to that is that um, finding a long-term solution is this Cabinet's priority as well. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Councillor Cope and to you, Ms Shotton. That concludes questions from members of the public this evening. So moving on to agenda item seven, questions from members of this council. Agenda item 7A, question number one from a member regarding southern water and discharges into the sea. And I have this from Councillor Yates. Councillor Yates. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is a question for Councillor Pugh. Um, does Councillor Pugh agree with me that following raw sewage being dumped along Thanet's coastline, that it is worrying that southern water being unable to confirm in writing that the permitted pumping speeds required a Margate pumping station of 809 litres per second have been met over the past couple of years. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Yates. Councillor Pugh. 
Thank you, Councillor Yates, uh, for your question. Uh, the regulator body, regulator body for the authorisation of discharges from the pumping station is the Environment Agency, and as part of the authorisation, uh, as part of the authorisation, there will be conditions to control discharge. While these issues have been raised with the Environment Agency, any such breaches would be enforced by them. And I'm sure Councillor Yates is aware that we continue to liaise with Southern Water and the Environment Agency on the instances that happen along our shore. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Pugh. Councillor Yates, do you have a supplementary? Um, I do, as you might expect. Um, yeah, thank you very much for that answer. Um, I have actually had it confirmed by the Environment Agency this week um, that they have opened a criminal investigation uh, based on the sewage incident on the 16th of June 2021 at Margate Pumping Station. Um, can Councillor Pugh confirm if he is aware that if the Broadstairs incident is also under a criminal investigation by the Environment Agency, by the Environment Agency, have they opened up a criminal investigation? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Yates. Councillor Pugh, are you able to answer that? Thank you, Councillor Yates. In response to your question, uh, they haven't yet, uh, but an investigation needs to take place uh, before they do. Um, but of course, once we know any information, I'll be more than happy to share that with you and all members of the council. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Pugh. Moving on to agenda item 7B, question number two from a member regarding safety boys. Uh, I pour upon Councillor Albon. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, this is for Councillor Pugh. Uh, can you please tell me why no safety boys were located off and along the main beaches to protect swimmers and beach users from jet skis, etc., in accordance with the Council's approved beach action plan? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor uh, Alban. Of course, this is boy spelt with a B-U-O-Y-S, so the floating variety. Councillor Pugh. Thank you, Chair. And I can confirm there's definitely not uh, young children tied to anchors located off our coast, not by the Council, um, or not because of us, by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, thank you, Councillor Alban, for your question. Um, I've been reliably informed by officers that the boys have been put out on the agreed locations at the start of the summer season, at the following beaches. We've got Minnis Bay, West Bay, St Mildred's Bay, Westbrook Bay, Margate and Ramsgate. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Pugh. Councillor Alban, do you have a supplementary? You I do, Chair. Um, just hearing the answer to that question, um, as a Ramsgate, East Cliff Ramsgate Councillor, I can confirm that no boys were placed outside or along Ramsgate Beach. Um, because of that, I believe that, that our visitors and residents were, were put at risk. And I would ask Councillor Pugh whether he thinks uh, our residents have been put at, put at risk. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Alban. Councillor Pugh. Thank you, Chair. And thank you, Councillor Alban, for your supplementary question. Um, I think it goes without saying that the Council's number one priority is the safety of all of our residents and visitors, particularly along our coastline. Um, and all water users should be able to enjoy the coastline as safely as possible. Um, we'll certainly look into that, and if that's not the case, then it will be remedied. But, you know, I'm well aware that USA ward members have received emails from residents, um, and we'll continue to look into it. And let's hope that we can try and find a medium that everyone's happy with. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Pugh. Agenda item 7C, question number three from a member regarding Airbnbs. I call upon Councillor Bailey. Councillor Bailey. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> uh, my question concerns the shortage of rental properties and the associated proliferation of Airbnbs. Um, I have been increasingly aware of the plight of local residents desperate to find places to rent in Thanet. I even know of a lady in her 80s who was issued a Section 21 notice but has still not been able to find anywhere else to rent in Thanet and she's, she's temporarily living with her brother. The current lack of uh, availability of rental property seems to be exacerbated, at least in part, by the increasing proliferation of Airbnbs. A shortage of rental properties will eventually put more pressure on the authority in terms of having to find additional temporary accommodation to house people. So this is a serious problem which could have ramifications for the council. I would like to ask, what is the council doing, or indeed what power does it have, perhaps through the review of the local plan, to address this issue? 
Do we know actually how many Airbnbs there are in the district? And is there a local requirement to register Airbnbs with the authority? And if not, do you think there should be? Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much. I call upon Councillor Jill Bayford to respond, who I presume has also spent a week preparing like a husband. Even Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Councillor Blade, for the question. The Council's adopted local plan includes an assumption that 6.3% of the local housing stock is second homes, which poten potentially includes holiday lets, and the housing requirements set out in the plan take this into account. This equates to around 4,000 dwellings. The local plan also has policies that both support the retention of residential dwellings, policy H022, and support the provision of self-catering accommodations as part of the local touring, tourism is, is industry, sorry, policy E08. The intention of policy H022 was to protect existing housing supply. There are some caveats, of which one is tourism use, but only where it meets the policy criteria. Poor location, unsuitability for your residential use, or heritage impacts. In the event that planning positions are required for a holiday let of this kind, the policies in the adopted plan are probably sufficient. However, see policy H022 can only be applied when there is a material change of use of a dwelling. In a, in a significant number of cases, it is unlikely that there will be a material change of use from a residential dwelling to a holiday let. For example, where a whole dwelling is let to a single family for their holiday. However, the Council considers all planning enforcement complaints in relation to short-term accommodation to assess whether a change of use has occurred, looking at the specific factors in each case. Any new local planning policy, specifically in relation to holiday letting, would need to be based upon robust evidence about how this impacted on the supply and affordability of local homes to meet locally identified needs. There is no current requirement to register an Airbnb or any other form of holiday let, not included hotels and HMOs that are covered by different legislation with the local council. As a result, we do not currently hold definitive figures. However, Airbnb have indicated that their platform has up to 1,316 listed properties. It is not clear whether these are whole dwellings or parts of a dwelling. A 2019 survey completed by Visit Kent identified 1,089 active Airbnbs rentals in Thanet, which does suggest that the recent trend in people holiday in the UK following the COVID-19 pandemic has fueled a rise in the number of Airbnbs locally. The mandatory registration or the effective planning control of holiday lets would require new national legislation or regulation. A number of national organisations, that's the B&B Association, Tourism Alliance, etc., have been lobbying for change and asking for a registration scheme to be introduced. As part of the government's tourism recovery plan published in June, one of the key initiatives was to launch a consultation on the introduction of a tourism accommodation regeneration scheme. The Conservative administration is committed to determining the impact of Airbnbs on the rental market in Thanet, but this must be weighed against value to our, our, our visitor economy which supports local employment. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Bayford. It's, uh, it's an emotive issue, but quite clearly very complicated. Do you have a supplementary, Councillor Bailey? Uh, yes, could I come back? Thank you, Councillor Bayford. Um, of course, there's no doubt in the economic benefits that short-term lets bring to the district, but there does need to be a balance between the availability of rental accommodation for local residents and the provision of short-term lets. Airbnb has actually started off as you know, renting rooms in houses, but now they're, but they're buying up housing stock, valuable housing stock for our, you know, from our residents. The email we, we received from Professor, uh, Professor Marina Novelli today regarding the proposed white paper was very interesting and gave some hope and some direction towards future regulations of Airbnbs. I just wondered what... Councillor Bailey, what can, TDC's you need response, to ask a question. I am asking the question. I just wondered what TDC's response is to the white paper. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, back to you, Councillor Bayford. 
Thank you, Councillor Bailey. Uh, yes, we, we will receive the email that you refer to, and as you can see, they're looking for national regu regulation, which this, this uh, administration certainly supports. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Bayford. Uh, agenda item 7D, question number four from a member regarding the availability of affordable housing. I call upon Councillor Austin. Thank you, Chair. Um, another one for Councillor Jill Bayford, um, and again uh, on a similar topic. At a recent drop-in session, the Director of Housing and Planning highlighted current pressures on affordable housing in Thanet, occasioned by rapidly rising private centre re sector rents, the reduced number of properties available for rent, and the very modest number of new properties we as a council have been building each year. What strategies is Cabinet adopting to address these issues, and in particular, to increase the number of council-owned properties available for rent. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Austin. Councillor Bayford, you're in the wars this evening, two in a row. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Councillor Austin, for the question. The Council has adopted a detailed housing, homelessness and rough sleeper strategy, which sets out the Council's proposals for providing affordable homes. The strategy is available on the Council's website. The strategy includes a strategic objective to improve access to and supply of housing, including affordable homes. It set out a detailed action plan and progress is reviewed by the Housing Cabinet Advisory Group. In particular, the strategy sets out how the Council and its Housing Association partners are working together to increase the supply of affordable homes and the action that the Council is taking to bring empty homes back into use. Over the past nine years, the Council has constructed or acquired 162 new homes for affordable rent and has approved funding in place for a further 28 new homes. These programmes have been supported with a total investment of £4.3 million, pounds, primarily from capital funding from the Council's housing revenue account, with additional support, including the right to buy receipts and home, Homes England grant. The total funding available for investment in this way is limited by the capacity of the Council's HRA to release capital funding or support borrowing. The current business plan projections include provision for further investment of around £8.1 million annually from 2024, which will prudently provide at least 30 new homes each year. The Housing Cabinet Advisory Group are due to consider the latest business plan projections at its next meeting and these will be presented to Cabinet and Council as part of the budget setting process 2022-23. In addition to the Council's activities, new affordable homes for rent are provided by our Housing Association partners. These homes are either provided in partnership with private sector house, private sector house builders through Section 106 agreements or supported by grants from Home, Homes England with the bulk of funding coming from housing associations' own business plans. The pace of delivery is strongly linked to the pace of private sector house building, and the Council works closely with private sector house builders to facilitate the delivery of approved homes. This year, we'll see 66 housing association homes completed in the, in the district, and with a number of strategic sites coming forward, this is set to increase in 2022-23 to around 350 sites. Homes. Excuse me. Although these programmes demonstrate the commitment of the Council to deliver more affordable homes for rent, both directly and with partners, we know that they are insufficient to meet the level of need for homes. We are therefore also committed, through our housing, homeless and rough sleeper strategy, to explore new models of funding and delivery, and will continue to keep this under review through the work of our Cabinet Advisory Group. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Bayford. Councillor um, Austin, do you have a supplementary? I do, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Bayford. Uh, in the light of dramatically rising fuel bills and the additional hardship caused to some of our poorest families by the removal of the universal credit uplift, can Cabinet outline what steps we're taking to ensure that all our housing is insulated to a high standard in order both to meet our climate emergency commitments and to help relieve fuel poverty? Thank you. 
Thank you, Councillor Austin. Back to you, Councillor Bayford. I'm not sure how related that is to the first question, but again, our, our housing strategy on the um, website covers all those things. Okay, thank you. Yes, that was very brave. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, councillors. Moving on to agenda item eight, motions on notice. Now, we have three motions on notice, uh, and in accordance with council procedure rule three, please note that the time allowed for consideration of motions shall not exceed 30 minutes. I ask members to be as succinct as possible. So, straight on to agenda item 8A, a motion on notice regarding disabled persons parking bays. I call upon Councillor Whitehead to introduce her motion and word it. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, and as you said, I'm very aware that we have a significant number of motions this evening, so I'll try and be as brief as possible. The social model of disability, as opposed to the medical model of disability, argues that we are disabled not by our medical and physical needs, but by our environment not adjusting to those needs. In terms of our provision for disabled parking, we are currently not adjusting the environment to the needs of our residents. Under KCC and TDC provision, blue badge holders can apply for a parking spot based on their blue badge status, but that parking spot can be used by anyone with a blue badge. This means that those who are most in need in terms of mobility and access, so much so that they have been formally assessed as requiring close and direct access to their vehicle by local authorities, can and often do lose that facility, as the parking spot that is intended specifically to make their life easier is not specifically allocated to them, making its purpose in relation to that individual, individual redundant. We not only need to recognise the importance of disabled parking bays performing their actual function, but also assess the number of street-based bays we have generally available in relation to the numbers of our population requiring them to ensure that we have sufficient provision. Other councils are already leading on this. Personalised bay permits are not a new policy. Hackney and Tower Hamlets and others already offer personalised bay permits to ensure that disabled individuals with limited mobility can always access their homes and vehicles without worry. I ask this council to commit to an internal audit of the number of disabled parking spaces available on our roads in relation to the numbers of residents requiring them, and to commit to contacting and working alongside KCC to bring forward a personalised permit scheme so that our application-based disabled parking bays can finally perform the role that is intended. Thank you. Uh, yes, um, the actual wording of the motion, you might want to read out. Of course. Yep. To paraphrase, um, this council commits to an internal audit of the number of disabled parking spaces available in relation to the number of residents requiring them and commits to contacting and working with KCC to bring forward personalised permits so that our application-based disabled parking bays can perform the role that is intended. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Whitehead. Have you a seconder? I do there. I can't make it. Councillor Keane. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Keane. Now, would members please note that in accordance with Council Procedure Rule 3.7, if the motion is seconded, then it will be referred to Cabinet as it relates to a Cabinet function. That is, unless Council decides to debate the motion. Now, if Council wishes to debate the motion, then following debate, the motion will be referred to Cabinet in accordance with Council Procedure Rules 3.8A4. In accordance with Council Procedure Rule 3.7, a member of the controlling political group is entitled to reply. So, in first instance, I call upon Councillor David Saunders. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Councillor Whitehead, for your excellent preambles. Um, I'm going to respond, actually, um, to the motion, um, and for the benefit of members who are not fully aware of the current situation, which obviously Councillor Whitehead is, and so am I from the uh, various uh, communications I receive um, from disabled re residents in my ward. Um, so I just wanted to uh, confirm that the scheme ref referred to is controlled by KCC under the existing agency agreement whereby qualifying blue badge holders can apply for a disabled bay to be installed outside their residence. 
This very subject was in fact recently covered under Agenda Item 8 of the Joint Transportation Board meeting on the 16th of September. This scheme is managed by TDC on behalf of KCC and details of the application process as it currently stands can be found on the website. In response to um, the question regarding uh, the number, currently I can confirm there are 164 on-street bays within the district and up to 5% of parking bays or parking positions within a road could be designated as disabled bays on application. This is the downside that you referred to. If approved, that's the application. If the, approved, if the application is approved, there's a one-off payment of £250 to cover the amount of work involved and to get the bay written into a traffic regulation order. The KCC agreement does not allow personalised permits for such bays, which basically means that once installed, any blue badge holder can park within the bay. And I think that's the, uh, the nub. But I, as far as um, I'm concerned, we do know the number. Um, the Joint Transportation Board are very aware of this situation and they are regularly reviewing uh, where we're at with it and also with KCC. Um, but, Chairman... That's uh, my piece. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Saunders. Now, if Council wish to debate this motion, I need a proposer and seconder. Do I have one? Councillor Alban, proposed. Do you have a seconder, Councillor Alban? Councillor Keane, thank you very much indeed. I look for somebody to commence. Yes, sorry, my peer. My peer. Can we have a vote? in favour of the to, to debate the motion. Those in favour, please. And those against the motion. And can I have abstentions? Thank you very much, members. So we will not be debating the motion, uh, but nevertheless, the, um, the proposal, the motion, will be carried forward to cabinet. Moving therefore on to agenda item B, and we have a second motion on notice regarding a joint local and national government task force to plan action to reach net zero emissions. And I call upon Councillor Garner uh, for his motion. Councillor Garner. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, as we all know, this year uh, we host the very important COP26 um, up in Scotland in November. And I've brought this motion to be considered by the Council, partly as a response to a statement made by um, Alok Sharma, um, MP, who's president of COP26, um, who said collaboration would be a key objective of the Climate Summit. In fact, he said, governments, business and civil society, sometimes called non-state actors and including local government, need to work together to transform the ways we power our homes and businesses, grow our food, develop infrastructure and move ourselves and goods around. Mm -hmm. So the motion I'm bringing to the meeting tonight is that in this year of COP26, that this council adds our voice to calls by the local government association and the association of directors of environment, economy, planning and transport and others for a joint local and national government ta task force to plan action to reach net zero emissions. Such a partnership can set appropriate regulations, benchmarks and targets and create the much needed long-term funding mechanisms to enable us in local communities and e economies to decarbonise whilst remaining resilient and sustainable. And the second part of the motion is that we ask that we write to Alok Sharma, MP, 
the Prime Minister and the Leadership Board of the LGA informing them of our support for a joint local national government climate change partnership task force and asking for one to be established as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Garner. Do you have a seconder for that? Councillor Wing, thank you very much indeed. Now, in accordance with Council Procedure 3.7, a member of the controlling political group is entitled to reply. I therefore call upon Councillor Bob Bayford, who is ready and waiting to prepare and give us our spe his speech for he's prepared for a week, I believe, is it? Yeah. Uh, this one about five minutes, Chairman. Um, no, I mean, I, I don't really have a speech. Um, if, if Councillor Garner wishes to, to debate this, happy to do that. But I want to assure him we support this motion absolutely wholeheartedly. We support the, the principle of it in the first bit, and I'm very happy to commit to us writing to Alex Sharma, the Prime Minister, and the LGA Leadership Board. And quite honestly, I think debating it would be a waste of Council's time. We're happy to support it absolutely 100%. Thank you. Thank you very much, indeed, Councillor Bayford. Uh, now then, uh, I should actually ask, do we wish to debate... Um, I'm yes. sorry, but I'm, I'm quite happy if, with that commitment from Councillor Bayford to do that, that there, there is no need for a, a debate, so I'm happy to leave it in Councillor Bay, Bayford's capable hands to send those letters off to those appropriate people. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> he has a reputation for trust. Do you actually need Right. Right. Therefore, members, uh, Councillor Piper. Thank you, Chair. I'm sure I probably know the answer to this already, but just for the benefit of the recording, uh, clearly, if there is no debate, the motion falls. None of us wants the motion to fall. If there is going to be no debate, is it possible for you, as Chairman, to waive that condition for this particular motion so that it doesn't? require a debate. Failing that, I'm quite happy to have a one-sentence conversation with somebody from a different political group, so there has been a debate. Thank, Thank you, you Councillor Piper. You have preempted me. In actual fact, I was just about to put it to the vote that we accept this motion. So those in favour of the wording of the vote put by Councillor Garner, could I please indicate? I think that's unanimous, isn't it? Thank you very much indeed. That will therefore be referred to Cabinet as the previous motion. I have now the third agenda item, motion on notice regarding Airbnbs, agenda item 8C. I call upon Councillor Yates. Thank you, Chair. Um, good evening, everyone, and some members of the public. Um, I don't have long, so I just want to say some statistics and briefly walk, briefly walk you through this motion. The statistics say that 33% of residents in Thanet are renters. There's been a 400% growth in Airbnbs from 2016 to 2019. There are over 300 whole property, entire place Airbnbs available in Margate, but only 15 rental, rental properties available in Margate. A typical rental property in Thanet goes around £800 a month. The typical Airbnb would charge £3,000 a month. Well below the average take-home monthly salary for a local Thanet resident of £1,700 after tax. Our own council and the Kent Fire and Rescue Services have confirmed that they do not know exactly how many whole property Airbnbs exist in Thanet. The call to this Airbnb motion, Airbnb motion called Point A, is for the council to work with the local plan advisory group to introduce planning rules that would allow local people a say in whether a house can be changed into a whole property Airbnb. This looks to give a community a say for the first time over the future of their streets and their neighbourhoods in relation to this. The second part of the motion looks to introduce a cap within the Airbnb platform of 90 days for the whole property Airbnbs, as happens in London. It does not look to restrict existing short-term let property owners from renting beyond those 90 days, merely to restrict the ability to advertise through the platform. Finally, a few quotes. Harry, who's the owner of the award-winning uh, Bottega Cruise restaurant in Margate, says that we've lost and we're losing staff at our work because they can't find places to rent. Alistair Baldwin from Holiday Letts in Kent said on BBC Radio Kent this morning that he does believe that we do need regulation. And finally, the chair of the Bed and Breakfast Association last year said that Airbnb was reckless in its disregard for UK law and regulations. So on to the motion. 
This council notes with concern the ongoing issues raised by residents around the growth in Airbnbs in Thanet, especially in relation to the reduction in long-term rentable properties. We welcome the majority of visitors to Thanet who make an important contribution to our economy, but we hear residents' concerns and wish to take action to control this serious issue, which is damaging our community and damaging the reputation of Airbnb. This council recognises that currently does not possess the powers to intervene and regulate these properties, and this is a problem faced by many local authorities across the country. Therefore, this council resolves to a work with the local plan cabinet advisory group to try and introduce planning restrictions that affect short-term rentals, such as change of use regulations that are required in Greater London to turn a property into an Airbnb property, and b ask the leader of the council to write to Mary Lorimer, the UK public policy manager at Airbnb, to request a meeting and seek to proactively introduce a 90-day annual limit for entire home rentals in Thanet within the Airbnb platform. Airbnb currently has a lock on their platform that does not allow Greater London entire home properties to be rented out for more than 90 days a year. I propose this motion. Thank you very much, Councillor Yates. Now, is, do you have a second to Councillor Yates? Councillor Aram Rolfe, I believe. Yes. Now, in accordance with Council Procedure Rule 3.7, a member of the controlling political group is entitled to reply. I therefore call upon Councillor Jill Bayford, who will be able to refer to her previous answer, I think. Thank you. Indeed, indeed I will. Thank you, Chair. Um, although committed to determining the impact of Airbnbs on the rental market, this administration does not feel that it is appropriate to pro propose any policy cha changes concerning Airbnb without properly quantifying the actual impact of Airbnb on the rental property market and its contribution to Thanet's touring economy. This is... It is sorry. <laughs> This administration is committed to exploring whether new policies in respect of Airbnb might be beneficial, but these must be measured and reasonable and formulated against a backdrop of factual information. On this basis, we don't believe that debating this motion is helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Bayford. Now, members should note that as only Council can adopt this motion on notice, the motion will fall if the Council does not agree to debate it. Can I have a proposal and a second to debate the motion? motion. Councillor Alban, seconded Councillor Rolfe. Right, those in favour to debate the motion, could I have your hands? Thank you very much. Can I have those against debating the motion? Thank you very much. Can I have abstentions? And I don't see any abstentions. Thank you very much. We will not be debating the motion this evening. Therefore, the motion falls. Thank you very much. Moving on to agenda item nine, uh, the leader's report. I call upon Councillor Ashby. Thank you, Chair. Thanet District Council's annual residence survey of 6,000 people is well underway, inviting our residents to have their say and what is really important to them. As ward councillors, we are all aware of the subjects of complaints that we are asked to deal with. This, coupled with the survey outcome, will focus on where the council services should be prioritised. Our challenge comes when trying to address the expectations of delivering improvements in the areas that are of main concern with the restraints of reduced resources. Hard decisions have to be made every year during the budget building process and this year will be no exception. But as a council we have to constantly look at ways to improve efficiency whilst maintaining standards and delivering a balanced budget. Revenue income from new additional sources are vital for the future survival of all local authorities and a sound commercial strategy is a must for the future. As our season, summer season draws to a close and the sleepy autumn days are upon us, it is time to look at the impact on the visitor economy from both income and benefits to the district, but also the cost to the council for town and beach safety and management and clean-up <coughs> operations. The staycation produced an increase in visitors and train travel to Thanet alone increased by 71% during the peak season. 
This trend is predicted to continue into next year and beyond. I think members will agree that the beach management plan, which was implemented for the second consecutive season, has proved very successful and maintained a structured approach for the district. A massive 1,800 tonnes of litter was collected throughout the season. 7,000 hours of litter picking completed across eight of Thanet's most popular beaches by council staff, which does not include the incredible efforts from the local community and groups for litter picking in many areas across the Isle, for whom we should be most thankful. The main conundrum for the council is to find a way to generate revenue from visitors that offsets the operational costs paid for by local residents, that doesn't harm the business economy by deterring visits, visitors from coming to our beautiful beaches, towns and villages. A local tourist levy may be something that could be considered as it is being done in various other city locations and heavy tourism areas. At present, there is very little evidence to the benefits or downsides, but a voluntary scheme could be a good starting point. Part of our climate and biodiversity emergency declaration has seen the launch of a different approach to work on council-maintained flower beds in various coastal locations. A move away from the more traditional planting of annuals and replace them with perennials plants may improve biodiversity and help to create habitats for pollinators such as bees, butterflies and moths, which we know are in serious decline and also <laughs> it will also enhance soil life and importantly vital and importantly increase the visual appeal and beauty of the beds for the residents and visitors who enjoy them. The Council has commissioned Full Street Place consultants to carry out a feasibility study on the redevelopment of Westbrook Loggia at Westbrook Bay. And as Ward Councillor, I'm looking forward to seeing the outcome of the survey, which asks for people's views on a sustainable year-round use. The Loggia was originally constructed as a bathing pavilion in the early 1900s, and the building owned by Thanet District Council is currently empty, except for a, selection of op a sele section occupied by Thanet lifeguards and your leisure. Over the years, it has been difficult for the council to find the funds to maintain our iconic coastal buildings, and it is very sad for us to see them fall into disrepair over the years. Hopefully, this will find a solution for the building and restore it to its former glory that is sustainable for both the community and visitors alike. The pandemic was a devastating blow to all parts of the community and businesses. Now it is vital for the local economy recovery that we all support our local traders and recognise that use it or lose it is a very much reality statement. During October the Fiverr Fest which is part of the totally local campaign is an initiative for independent businesses to encourage people back to our towns and village centres by offering five pound bargains. There will be posters in shop windows and information about the campaign is available in our social media channels. October marks the first anniversary of our in-house tenant and leaseholder services. The service was set up in October 2020 to manage our residential properties and currently looks after over 3,400 individual properties following the disbanding of EKH. The key aim was to improve the service levels along with improving the condition of our estates and rectifying health and safety issues identified under the EKH tenure. The new, term, the new team now numbers 58 and is a mix of East Kent housing and new staff. The team has received skilled, skills training and is fully focused on improving the services we provide to tenants and leaseholders. A number of initiatives to improve how the team communicate with our customers are now in place and a service improvement plan has been developed, which includes working on a wide range of projects such as improving the appearance of the estate, identifying new heating solutions for the tower blocks. I believe that since the service has been brought in-house, and I'm sure the Cabinet holder, Councillor Jill Bayford, would agree, that there has been a major improvement in the all-round service. Bob Porter and his team, and all associated with the integration, should be congratulated for their efforts in what has appeared to be a very smooth process, with very little, if any, interruption to the service. There are various town projects ongoing, um, which I will update as follows. The work continues on our Ramsgate Future Initiative to create a plan for the future of Ramsgate, 
that supports a thriving town centre and the needs for local people. The Ramsgate Town Future Town Investment Plan pulls together existing schemes like the Future High Street Fund, the High Street Heritage Action Zone, to create a vision to transform the town. The public engagement stage has now finished and the next step is pulling together the feedback to finalise the document which is due to be published next month. This week we launch a survey for local people to have their say on proposed highway improvements in Ramsgate on Tuesday the 12th of October as part of the Future High Street Fund. The council is looking for feedback on improvements to the roads and pedestrian areas of Ramsgate with a view to create a more welcoming space for pedestrians and to reduce the dominance of cars in the area, as well as contribute to the wider generation of the town centre. The Margate Town Deal process has now entered phase two of the town deal process, which includes the development of the Green Book business cases to demonstrate the feasibility, viability and value for money of the projects. External consultants, PRD Limited, have been appointed to assist the board with this process. The first business case su summary will be submitted to government in the next week or so. I very much enjoyed my visit to the Ramsgate 200th Royal Harbour status celebrations on the 25th of September and the taking part in the parade and watching the morning drumhead service. The long history of the harbour and the visit by King George IV in 1821, which resulting in him gifting the Royal Ascent, is something we should all be proud of and cherish, especially as it's the only Royal Harbour in the country. Ramsgate Football Club should also be congratulated in the work they are doing for the community, especially in relation to the HAC Pro programme. During my visit back in the school holidays, summer holidays, I witnessed the benefit of the HAC programme that was, ha was having the benefits that for the programme was having for both children and parents. It was explained to me that the government scheme, although supporting the main holidays, was not supporting the half-term holiday, the one that is actually coming up in a couple of weeks' time. I approached River Oak Strategic Partners to see if they would be willing to contribute, who have not only agreed the funding for the hot meals for the course, but have also arranged for flight simulators, VR headsets, for which the children can learn about vocational jobs and much more for the half-term holiday. I was hoping to end my report on a high note and report the good news that following the Southern Water incident at Fullness pumping station back in June, that a regular communication line between the council and Southern Water had been established, a members briefing with the Southern Water Chief Executive Ian McCauley had taken place, a payment of 100000 to the council in recognition of my request for compensation for June incident had been made, and the statement from Southern Water that they had authorised the drainage study for Sanit at cost to Southern Water of 400 million. Of course, all of this is now marred by yet another major incident on Tuesday, the 5th of October, at Joss Bay Pumping Station. My understanding is that electrical failure occurred at 8.45 a.m. and the backup generator did not kick in. Due to the need for a qualified electrician to isolate the problem, the site did not come back online until 10.30 a.m. During that period, unscreened wastewater was discharged through the short outfall. TDC was not notified of this discharge by Southern Water and in fact the problem was identified by the TDC officer. Just listen off chair. At the time of writing this report, the advice to bathers not to enter the water and walk below the high water mark was, was in place, but I'm pleased between, sorry, between Westbrook and Western Underfield Lambsgate, but I am slightly the bearer of better news is today um, 13 out of the 14 bays have now had the restrictions lifted, but Joss Bay remains under warning. As I stated in my numerous TV interviews and statements in the res to the residents and businesses, this is totally unacceptable and simply should not have happened. Any organisation that relies on a power supply to operate any vital part of their operational infrastructure should have backups that are fully tested and ready for operational operation when needed. I have written to Ian McCauley requesting a meeting to discuss this matter which is now being arranged for uh, I believe the week after next. I have also requested that our MPs take the matter up in Parliament. Letters to the Environment Agency and Northwalk are also on the, on the way. Expressing my deep concern and complete frustration on this matter. Thank you Chair. Thank you very much indeed Leader. Uh, <coughs>
<laughs> I did feel we did want to hear everything that we had to hear about uh, the southern water there. It was important for us to hear that. Uh, moving on to um, Councillor Everett to comment on questions in relation to the leader's report. Councillor Everett. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> um, I'd like to thank the leader for the advanced copy of her report. Um, and I believe that um, she may be celebrating a significant birthday this week. So um, I, I will wish her a happy birthday. You will all be pleased to hear that I won't be singing, unlike Councillor Python on the previous occasion. Um, I don't propose to comment on everything that she said. Um, I'm glad that she's um, found a, a wide range of topics to talk about, lots of things going on in the district. Um, a bit disappointing, therefore, that next week's Cabinet meeting has been cancelled and there's been very little business at the last two Cabinet meetings. I know these things do happen from time to time, um, but there's a slight slight oddity there, so no doubt there'll be more business coming forward in the future. The residence survey um, is important, not least to see how public opinion evolves over time, but all councillors who are active in their ward should have a good idea of public priorities, especially around the public realm and efficiency. The council's challenge, whoever is in charge, is in delivering cleaner streets and public spaces, in particular without spending more money. Can she reassure us also that the council is able to recruit to any vacancies that it does have in enforcement, street cleansing and waste collection on the wages that it pays. And if there are staff shortages, what plans does she have to deal with them so they don't further impact on residents? She mentions the growth in the visitor economy, and notwithstanding the issue of Airbnbs, we all recognise how important it is to the prosperity of the district. And she mentioned the significance of the beach management plan, and I think that that and the lessons learned last year um, it does seem that a lot of good work has been done. Of course, that was done under the Labour administration. Um, but, of course, obviously, we rely on our officers, whichever political party is in control. Um, another issue which uh, was resolved under the Labour administration, I have to point out, was council housing management uh, being brought back in-house and the subsequent transition. And I do congratulate the officers involved, as I think they've done a great job, as did the then Cabinet member, Councillor Whitehead. Um, I also want to welcome the recent housing surgeries, including the ones I've attended in Newington. I think that's a really good initiative, as it gives the opportunity to discuss the issues on the ground where we can see them, not just with the residents, but also between ward councillors and officers. And I hope that they're going to carry on. In terms of the uh, Ramsgate Future Initiative, which was also kicked off by Labour, I'm pleased to see the uh, Future High Street and Heritage Action Zone initiatives progressing. I hope that we're going to hear about a successful outcome for both the levelling up bids around the time of the Chancellor's budget statement at the end of the month, because the one in Ramsgate certainly can make a real difference to the town. Like many members, I went on the recent tour of Southern Waters Pumping Station at Cliftonville, and I don't question the good intentions of some of their staff who we met. Unfortunately, it felt pretty pointless. As she said, a few days later, there was yet another system failure, yet another sewage discharge, and as she tells us, the Council wasn't even notified. I don't really know what more we can do as elected members, but the public certainly needs to understand that the Council shares its frustration, and we on this side echo what she said about it. Um, I've also visited Ramsgate Football Club to see their new artificial pitch, as you might expect, um, and I've introduced them to some of the key people at the heart of the community in Newington to try to maximise the benefit of their community work with some of our most disadvantaged residents. And I do think what Ramsgate Football Club is doing is excellent. Um, I don't have any issue with RSP funding some of those activities because whatever you think the future of Manston should be, there's no question that Ramsgate and Fanning have been damaged economically by the apparently never-ending delay in deciding the future of the site. And RSP are, in part at least, responsible for that delay. If the local plan review wasn't being delayed for other reasons, we'd probably have to put that on hold to wait for the Secretary of State to make his DCO decision and the likely fallout from that to, to uh, flow through. So we don't agree, Councillor Ashby and I, on what the decision should be, and we never will agree on it, but can she, least, can she at least agree with me that she will press the Secretary of State to get on and make one? Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Everett. Leader, wish to re respond. Uh, okay, um, I only picked up one sort of main question um, is regarding the uh, staff shortages. I mean, this is a national problem. Um, I can't recall that, that, I think the numbers are over um, a million vacancies within the country. 
Um, so staff shortages is a, is a horrendous problem. Over 100,000 truck drivers just alone. The council, um, I believe, have um, coped really well with, uh, especially with the, the lorry driver uh, situation, in that there has been very little disruption to our refuge collection. So I think the department uh, responsible for that should be commended um, that we've kept ourselves going. Unlike um, Brighton, that I think is knee high in rubbish as we speak. Great. Well, I, <laughs> I wasn't going to mention the party, but um, I was just complimenting our council. I, I don't need to, uh, to mention other parties. Um, I take on board um, that a lot of work for the um, beach management was um, established under, uh, actually, Councillor Albans. Uh, and um, I thank the, the Labour group for setting things up so it makes my life so easy in the, in the two years that I had to uh, manage. Um, the start, they said the boys, yeah, the boys weren't, um, I'll, I'll be out there. Um, I would agree with you, it is incredibly frustrating, the delay to, um, the, on the decision for Manston Airport. And like yourself, although we don't want the, the same outcome, the same decision, um, there will be, there are a lot of noises being made regarding speeding this up because it is affecting our local plan. It affects all the island strategy on how we move forward. So I can write to the Secretary of State. I'm sure he'll take lots of notice of me, but um, I will write. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Leader. I call upon the Councillor Reverend Piper to comment on or quest, ask questions in relation to the Leader's report. Thank you, Chair. Um, as Councillor Everett has already said, it is a very thorough and fulsome report, uh, and we thank you for that. It, it is a, an opportunity that we have to hear from you just some of the things, and I'm absolutely certain it's not all of the things, that you've been involved in on our behalf. I would just uh, like to add that all our thanks should go to all of those people who got dirty cleaning up for the benefit of the rest of us. The figures that you mention in terms of litter uh, and visitors, uh, I mean, it's just astonishing the amount of muck that visitors and local residents, it has to be said, leave behind. So our thanks should go to everyone who got dirty on our, our behalf. Um, I think we've got, a, uh, uh, we've got a slight conundrum coming, that's for sure. If we work really hard at uh, preventing cars from coming into our town centres to do any shopping, the council isn't going to get any parking money, which is a problem for us further down the road, I feel sure. Um, and I would find myself wondering how much people would have to pay to park their car in order to go and buy their item for a fiver from the local business in the middle of the town centre. I jest, of course. Um, and finally, really, thank you for all your hard work with Southern Water. I know because you've been kind enough to phone from time to time and provide updates. Uh, the work that you have done with them and with officers of the council to help to try and resolve these issues. And uh, to a fellow wordy nerdy, Mr. Chairman, I would just say that I mean issues in every sense of the word. Thank you for your report, Leader. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Piper. Anything you'd like to add to that, Leader? Yes, um, thank you for, for your comments, Councillor Piper. It was quite nice to see him a call in front of the Audit Committee yesterday, feeling the heat. Um, is, I always struggle a little bit with this, I must confess. Um, so it was nice to see that he was getting some stick there. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Garner, I call upon you to comment or ask questions in relation to the Leader's report. Thank you. Well, um, going last, I... I also um, like to start by, like um, Councillors Everett and Piper, thanking you for your report and for the um, quite extensive updates it contains on a number of positive projects and initiatives taking place across the, the district. In Thanet, we're very lucky to have a team of hard-working officers plus a wide variety of community groups and individuals who work to make our community a better place for both residents and visitors. They do this in a number of different ways, some of which the leader mentions in her report. It might be by helping to collect some of the 1,800 tonnes of litter left on our beaches and in our towns this year, 
or it might be as part of one of the many gardening groups she mentions across the district working to create more of the habitats for pollinators uh, and improving the aesthetics of our towns and villages at the same time. Or it might also be by responding to one of the many surveys mentioned because they have a good understanding of what needs to happen in their area and are passionate about making things better for everyone who live, lives here and who visits. And finally, it might also be because they run a small business and have struggled during the pandemic, so are taking part in the Fiverr Fest as part of the Totally Locally campaign, which we should all support. So with all that hard work and community involvement, I have to say that it comes as a real slap in the face to all of them and all of us when we have to suffer yet another southern water sewage discharge causing more devastating damage to our coastline and closing our beaches for even longer than the last time. After the sewage leak in Fourness in June caused by a power failure following a lightning strike, we listened to Ian McCauley and his team promised to urgently improve the situation. He told us this was a priority for him and yet here we are a couple of months down the line and another power failure at another of their pumping stations. It's almost as if they're doing all they can to make life as difficult as possible for us and the people of Thanet. Mr Macaulay and his team need to be made to pay for this continued negligence, which allows our coastline to be decimated while their shareholders collect their dividends. While it's not in our gift to bring them to book legally, and I'm pleased to hear that a criminal investigation is underway, we certainly need to seek a much larger recompense from them than the 100000 they paid for the last discharge from Fourness. If they can afford multi-million pound payouts to their shareholders, they can certainly afford to pay a seven-figure sum for us to use to invest in new facilities, including toilet blocks around the coastline for residents and visitors to use, as well as to fund other significant environmental improvement and other projects that many community groups are currently struggling to find funds to progress. Mr Macaulay and his team are responsible for causing great damage to the reputation of our area. We should make sure that they are responsible for paying reparations to make it good again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Garner. Of course, many of those shareholders are pension funds. Uh, having said that, Leader, would you like to respond? Thank you. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try and follow that. Um, sorry, they didn't pick up any uh, direct questions, but again, you know, Southern Water is, is top of our list. Um, I will be writing, as you can imagine, and having some words. Um, and I was envisaging sticking another note on the end of it. So... Um, I'm not saying that uh, I haven't got any sort of leverage to get that. I would love to take them to court, but this council can't afford to do that. Um, I'll leave that to the Environment, the environment Agency because they're, they're the ones that, that fund their, the legal cases, but unfortunately they're the ones that get the 90 million that went into the coffers uh, the last time, and that doesn't disseminate back down to the district's um, authorities that actually uh, suffer from it. So... That might be a question for the Environment Agency, that if they would like to share some of that uh, for the June spill. No doubt, I think they'll be pushing again for another legal challenge. They might well join the two together, um, but we are in constant touch with the Environment Agency. So, yes, needless to say, I will be, um, well, it won't be writing, it'll be a visit um, with Mr McCauley, uh, along with the Chief Executive and with the two MPs. Um, and... I, all I can say is that the kicking that he got last time will be twice as hard this time. So I will ask for a million. Whether we get it or not will be another matter. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Leader, and we look forward to the, one of those millions coming our way. Agenda item 10, report of the Chair of the Overview and Scrutiny Panel. Now, Bob, uh, Councillor Bayford, I see you on the edge of your chair, but you, and I know that's your favourite committee, but the Chairman is in actual fact Councillor Piper. Councillor Piper. Yeah, he's a hard act to follow, Chair, that's for sure. Um, Chairman, I'd like to offer my thanks to uh, Mr Charles Hungway 
and uh, Mr Nick Hughes for their admin support for this committee. Sometimes it is quite substantial. Um, and to members of the committee who have sat and considered items at our overview and scrutiny meetings. We are progressing through the work schedule and are always open to receive ideas of topics for consideration. We're looking into next year from Easter onwards at the moment. This report, of course, outlines our work programme with some feedback of things that have already happened and things that are to happen uh, in the near future. I would also like to thank uh, Mr Hughes and Ms Culligan for offering members the training programme around overview and scrutiny recently, which gave us all really an insight into the business of calling of decisions. Uh, it was not done in any way to prevent call-ins, but really to educate us so that we knew how to call the subject in and it didn't fall at a, a, a seemingly uh, a ridiculous little hurdle uh, where it hadn't quite met the bar. Um, so thank you for offering the training. I'm not yet aware of exactly how many people attended, but I attended myself and it was very informative. Um, uh, members, th there it is. I commend the report to you, along with an invitation, if there's nothing you can think of at this precise moment that you'd like us to look at, an invitation to write in and ask us to look at subjects you might want us to review in the future. Thank you, members. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Piper. Do members have any comments? I don't see any. Always a good sign of a report when there aren't any comments. Agenda item 11, Capital Programme Scheme, Ramsgate Future High Street Fund. I call upon Councillor Pugh to introduce. Councillor Pugh. Thank you, Chair. This report is requesting the approval of, additional, of adding an additional scheme into the Capital Programme for the Town's Fund. The Council was successfully awarded just over £2.7 million for two projects in Ramsgate, including a highway scheme and the delivery of a creative workspace in the Town Centre. This is the maximum award from the Department for Leveling Up Housing and Communities, and the capital funding within our programme will be no more than the total £2,704,213. All the investment and costs associated with the delivery of the future High Street Fund projects are fully funded from external grants and contributions, and all expenditure relating to the interventions will be managed with the total package of funding provided to ensure there is no risk of financial exposure to the Council. I recommend approval uh, that an allocation is made in the capital programme in order that the Council may deliver these capital, two capital projects. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much indeed, Councillor Pugh. Uh, have you got a seconder for that? Councillor Bayford. Thank you very much. Do members agree? Thank you very much. Agenda item 12, the Annual Treasury Management Review for 2020-21. I call upon Councillor David Saunders. Thank you, Chairman. And I'm afraid, members, there's an air of deja vu as I read out... Um, my uh, introduction to this report and indeed the report itself. The, re the introduction reads, the report summarises a background look on our Treasury management activity for 2020-21. The figures remain provisional because our 2020 and 21 accounts have still not as yet been audited and are therefore subject to change until the audit is completed. <coughs> The regulatory environment places responsibility on members for the review and scrutiny of the Treasury management policy and activities. This report is therefore important in that respect as it provides details of the 2020-21 year end position for Treasury activities. Firstly, I am pleased to report that all of our activities operated within the limits agreed by members but the other key messages that I have summarised from the report are that our capital expenditure and was significantly under budget, as detailed in the following budget outturn report, that we repaid £631,000 of debt during the year and undertook 
no new borrowing, that our average debt position was 25 million, and that we did not borrow more money than we needed to finance our capital programme. As such, we stayed well within our authorised limit of £109 million. I move the recommendation as detailed in 12.1. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Saunders. Have I got a seconder for that? <coughs> Councillor Bayford again. Do members agree? Agreed. Thank you very much. Moving on to agenda item 13, Statement of Community Involvement Review, Results of Public Consultation and Adoption. I call upon the leader, Councillor Ashby. Thank you, Chair. The Statement of Community Involvement sets out how the Council will consult on planning, issue policy, plan, sorry, planning policy issues, planning applications and neighbourhood plans. The SCI was originally adopted in Council in 2007. A revised and updated SCI was adopted by Council in 2012. It is considered appropriate that the SCI should be reviewed now in line with the forthcoming local plan review and to reflect changes in methods and communications and engagement. There is also a requirement under the Town and Country Planning Regulation that SCIs are reviewed every five years. The Council carried out a public consultation on the SCI review from the 25th of February to the 9th of April 2021. This report sets out the main issues raised in response to that consultation and any resulting changes to be made to the SCI. I recommend that the Council adopt and publish the revised statement of community involvement. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Ashby. Do you have a seconder? Councillor Bayford, again. Do members agree? Thank you very much indeed. Agenda item 14, representation on outside bodies. I move as chairman that the council agrees to add the Manston Skills and Employment Board to the list of executive outside bodies. Do I have a second for that? Councillor Pugh? Oh. Councillor Lees. Councillor Lees, I've got you there instead. Do members agree? Thank you. Agenda item 15, appointment of the Grievance Committee and Grievance Appeals Committee for Statutory Officers. I move the Council approves the recommendations in the report. Can I have a seconder? Councillor Saunders. Do members agree? Yeah. Councillor Everett, do you wish to say, speak? Thank you. Uh, I do, Chair, thank you. And uh, I'm going to speak very narrowly to the report members will be pleased to hear. Um, I just wanted to draw members' attention to the fact that this item has been a very long while in the works. And uh, members of GP uh, General Purposes will know that this matter was discussed as long ago as January 2020. And as the report notes, um, General Purposes eventually considered the policy on the 30th of September 2020 when it came back from EKHR, um, the... Um, Joint Services Arrangement for Dealing with HR. Um, I think it's unsatisfactory that it's taken that this long to get not only to that meeting, but also to come before the Council tonight. But I do understand that um, it does involve some contractual negotiation with our statutory officers because um, it's not a statutory process of itself. Um, nevertheless, I think it should be understood that it has been in the works and that it has been brought forward and members have done their bit in bringing it forward. And I also just want to um, draw attention to the paragraph 1.1 um, where it talks about the, the policy and it says GPC had requested that a policy be written that closely reflects the Joint Negotiating Committee JNC model grievance procedures for Chief Executives. Now that's what we've got in front of us, that's what we should have in front of us and I get a bit fed up with listening to people outside the Council who seem to be of the opinion that members did not want to or do not intend to follow the JNC model for grievance procedures. That is what we are agreeing hopefully tonight, members, and I hope people outside the Council get that message too. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Everett. Councillor Ashby. Yes, fully endorse that. Um, this is the final piece of the jigsaw that needs to be completed for, for the processes. So I'm pleased that this has come this far. Um, the delay was some not 
really the the fault of uh, necessarily members or even officers putting it together. There were just some um, regularities that had to be ironed out before we got there. But um, I would commend um, Estelle for her work on this because it has been a, a difficult document to get together and finalise. So um, I would, uh, if it is for seconding chair, I will second. I also can give the names for the um, representatives from our group if you wish. Thank you very much indeed, Leader. Uh, I don't see any but any other comments. Uh, therefore, can members agree this appointment? Thank you very much indeed. Agenda item 16, report back from the East Kent Joint Independent Renumeration Panel regarding amendments to members allowance scheme for 2021-2022. This is report is for information only. Would members note the report? Agenda item 17, changes to committees, panels and boards. Respect with respect to proportionality, following consensus between the group leaders, I move the council approves the proportionality between groups for committees, panels and boards for the remainder of the 2021-22 uh, municipal year shown in the paragraph 4.1.1 of the report. Can I have a seconder? Councillor Ashby. Now, do members agree? Thank you. Moving on to nomination of members to serve on committees, group leaders may take this opportunity to advise of changes to the nominations to committees, panels and boards for the remainder of the 21-22 year. Councillor Ashby, do you wish to advise of any nomination changes? Uh, no, Chair. I would like to uh, defer my decisions until the next full council meeting. Thank you. Fair enough. Thank you. Councillor Everett. Councillor Piper. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Braidwood to standards. Uh, Councillor John Dennis to licensing. And Councillor Linda Potts to take the seat on the Housing Cabinet Advisory Group. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Piper. Councillor Garner. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, um, Councillor Garner, myself, I shall be on planning, and Councillor Wing will now be. Reserve from planning. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Garner. Moving on to agenda item 18, exclusion of the public and press. Would members please refer to supplementary agenda number one? Now, I move that the public and press be excluded from the meeting for agenda item 19, as it contains exempt information as defined in paragraphs 2 and 5 of part 1 of the Schedule 12A of the Local Government Act 1972, as amended. Can I have a seconder? Yeah. 